Okay, thanks everyone again for uh, jumping on here. So in last week's class, we finished the first uh, 10, 11 chapters of Kings 1, of Melachim 1. And it ends with the demise and the passing of Shlomo HaMelech. The only thing is that it actually doesn't say that he died. And it doesn't really give us his... It just says he reigned for 40 years and things like that. So we have to do the mathematics. But there is a book called Divri Hayyamim Chronicles. And it gives us a lot of dates and gaps where we see in the prophets, it helps us. In addition, at the end of chapter 10 of Kings, um, I'm hold on, Zali, I still hear the echo. I'm sorry, Zali, but you're gonna have to go into the den, okay? Um, give me a second. We can't we're hear you. Some tech, we're just having, I just put on mute for a second. Oh, okay. Yeah, my, can, there you go. You have to shut it off. Yeah, let's go on the couch over here. Um, it does say, though, at the end of chapter 10, that it actually says, now remember, we, we said that it was Jeremiah, the Talmud says it was Jeremiah who wrote the history of the book of Kings. So at the very end over there, in chapter 11, verse 41, it actually says, the rest of Solomon's days and his wisdom can, can be recorded or is recorded in the book of Shlomo, Sefer Shlomo. So it actually says that in the book of Kings, that the rest of the days of Solomon is recorded in the book of Shlomo. The commentaries tell us as well that this book of Shlomo is no, is no longer. We don't know where it is. We don't know what it is. It's a piece of history that's lost. There's another piece, another book, the book of Nathan, the prophecies of Nathan. Remember, Nathan was the guy that helped Shlomo Melch build the temple. And Shlomo Melech, when he was stuck on something, he asked his cheat sheet was Nathan. Mm -hmm. So there's a book of the Sefer Shel Nathan, and that's also lost. There's another book called Nevuoi Shel Achia Hashiloni, the prophecies of Achia Hashiloni. Achia Hashiloni, as you remember in last class, was the person that told Shlomo HaMelech because of the three sins that he did, that the reign of monarchy will continue from the tribe of Judah, but it won't be over all 12 tribes, it will continue through his son, Rechavam, but he will only rule over Judah and Benjamin, but not the entire 12 tribes. So this Achia Shaloni also has many, there's a book, but again, this book is lost according to the commentary. But there was those such books. So, you know, you have like these, uh, these uh, scavenger hunts to find certain books and papers. And that was one of the wonderful findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But these books, the Sefer Shal Shlom of the Book of Solomon and his wisdom, the book of Nathan and the prophecies of Achia Shaloni. So in Chronicles, it mentions and alludes to these books, but we don't have it. Um, Rashi and some of our commentaries uh, alludes to these books as well. But again, we don't, we don't, we don't, we just don't have date on it. So I just wanted to point that out. So this book, so now this class tonight is beginning with after the death of Shlomo, we already discussed that his son, Rechavim, continued to be the king of Judah and Benjamin, and there was a split. So let's just go quickly and look at the share screen. Okay, um, Lisa or Alan, just tell me that you can see my screen so I don't make the mistake as last week. Do you see my screen in front of you? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Very good. So here's the screen, and we're going to be kind of coming back to this chart because the rest of the book of Kings 1 and the rest of Kings 2 which is loaded with data and loaded with information about all these kings. It's obviously, we're not gonna go through all these roles and all these characters, but the rest of the book of Kings and the second volume of Kings, which is called Kings one and Kings two, always comes back to and references basically this chart, or rather I should say this chart is based off the two volumes of Kings. So the very top where my mouse is, is Saul, David, Solomon. And now after Solomon, we have now, in chapter 11 of Kings 1, we have now the divide and the break of the 12 tribes. So on the left side, it was always called Judah. 
It also has Benjamin in parentheses. It's a small tribe, but we'll just say the two tribes. And this first column are the names of these kings, which is Rehavim. It tells us how many years he reigned. And sometimes on the right side, you'll see in purple some of the prophets that assisted some of these kings. And then on the right side, you'll see here the kings of Israel, or it's referred to as the northern tribes. Now, it's not, it's not quite so north. When you think of the north, you think of Tzvat, the north of Israel. But in truth, this wasn't so north. Give me a minute. I'm going to go the other way. Just trying to find a chart. Give me a minute. Okay, here it is. So this is Benjamin. As you see, the tribe of Benjamin. This is the tribe of Judah. This is Jerusalem where the temple is built. This is on the left side of that chart where we're talking about the kings are the kings of Judah, like Rehavim, Solomon, his son. And eventually we'll see Rehavim will fortify the city of Jerusalem. And he needs to protect it, not just from the enemies without, but also from the enemies within. I don't want to call the 10 tribes the enemies because many times they got along. But basically there was going to be a hostile takeover. So he had to fortify Jerusalem from the 10 northern tribes. When I say north, I mean over here, the tribe of Manasseh, which is just a really just maybe 20 miles away. So that's Shamir, and that's what we call the north. Okay, I'm stopping the share. Back to me. And so right away, Rehavim, who wants to solidify his power, he decides to make a civil war because this guy, Yeravim, who is the first king of the north, of Israel. So anytime you, you hear me say the word the king of Israel, I'm referring to the northern 10 tribes. Anytime you hear me say the word the king of Judah, I'm referring to the kings on the left side that live in Jerusalem. So Yeravim, who is the king of Israel, he indeed wanted to uh, make a little bit of an invasion and Rehavim didn't want it as well. So there was literally going to be a civil war. So Shemariah, who was the prophet at that time, he tells Rehavim, look, Achia HaShiloni told your father that you're going to be a king and you're going to be a king only in Judah and Yeravim is going to be a king of the northern tribes. I don't see what, why you bent out of shape. We are fulfilling or you are fulfilling God's promise. So there's no reason to make a civil war. You got to live with this new predicament of the Jewish people and that's it. So indeed, he stopped a potential civil war. This is already after Rehavim rallied the troops. They say approximately 180,000 soldiers, but he stopped a potential civil war. Okay. Now, at the end of the day, Wait, Rehavim so was So there a, was a, not a civil war or there was? There was not. There, there was not a civil war. And Mira, if you don't mind, if you can just chat me your question, but there was not a civil war. Um... Continuing on. So Yeravim, he was a, felt a little slighted because at the end of the day, he's in the 10 tribes, he's in the north, but he doesn't have Jerusalem. He doesn't have this beautiful temple. It doesn't make him feel too good. And also he's a bit of a Talmud Chacham. He's a wise sage. And he also wants to bring sacrifices, but there's no, there's no place to bring sacrifices. So he decides to build a miniature temple. He builds a miniature temple, or rather a miniature altar, even though it was illegal to do so, because it was illegal to do so because you're not allowed to do anything outside of Jerusalem. So he gathers all the people and he decides to make an inauguration in the north, and he's gonna make this inauguration and have this beautiful altar and he rallies up thousands and tens of thousands of Jewish people, civil servants, and they're going to make like this uh, mini inauguration of a mini temple in the north. God sends Edo, the prophet. I actually have a friend. His name is Edo. And he was a prophet that was sent to warn this king, Yeravim, who was the first king of the 10 northern tribes. And he says in front of everybody, right when the king is ready to bring the sacrifices on this altar. 
can imagine there's thousands of people, think of like a staple center, there's a center basketball court, and Yeruvim is ordering now the sacrifices to be brought on the altar, and this old man with a stick comes, his name is Ido the prophet, and he says, you cannot do this, I forbid you to do this, because it's against the wishes of God. And right away, Yeruvim says, catch this man and send him out of here. And the second Yeruvim picks up his hand, and it goes limp and it goes crippled. The commentaries tell us that how amazing it is that God wasn't going to punish you, <clears throat> Yeruvim for making a desecration of going against his will because that was against God's will to make this altar outside of Jerusalem. But when it came to embarrassing a tzaddik, to embarrassing a prophet like Edo, this God did not want to tolerate. And that's why only when he was going, only when he embarrassed Edo, only then did God say, did God implement this, this crippling of Yeruvim the king. And this was in front of everybody. But Yeruvim, even after he got his power back, he still ordered the sacrifices to be brought. And Edo made a declaration, anyone that brings sacrifices on this altar, they and their children will be killed. They will not be buried properly. And even their bones that will be buried, it will be a matter of time until even the cemeteries and the graves will be dug up. A very vicious curse that he did unto them and their children. And indeed, it actually came true because these people did not listen to Edo. And they went ahead with bringing the sacrifices, even after Edo made this altar collapse and split down the middle. So that's the case with Edo. It's very hard again for us to truly understand what's going on over here because who, you know, who of us would say after we see this beautiful temple in Jerusalem, yeah, let's go and make altar outside of Jerusalem. It just doesn't add up. But again, it's hard to pr truly appreciate the addiction of idol worship at that time. Thank God we don't understand it today. We're on the contrary. Today, if someone says, I want to worship 20,000 different gods, you take them to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, you give them medication and so forth. And perhaps in those days, if they would hear that we're addicted to have 30 different pairs of shoes and 30 suits and four kinds of iPhones and iPads, they would say, we need that medication. So either way, there, you know, it's, there's a, a certain cultural gap here that it's hard for us to appreciate. But in any case, that's the story what happened with Yeruvim, the first king of Israel, the 10 tribes, and Edo the prophet. Edo is now is ready to head back to Jerusalem, his hometown. There was an older man, a Jew, who was living in the tent in the north, and he heard about Edo the great prophet. He tells his children, go and fetch for me this Edo, because I want to host him for a night. But God already told Edo, I don't want you to sleep over even one night outside Jerusalem. You did your job, and now it's time to come back to Jerusalem. But the old man living in the north, he didn't want to miss an opportunity. Can you imagine you get to invite the president, you get to invite the great prophet of the time, Edo, to your house and serve him a hamburgers and hot dogs. So Edo said, I'm sorry to his children, to the old man's children. I can't come because I have a mission to go back. The old man tells his kids, just bring him for dinner. He's not going to sleep over. Okay, so he comes over for dinner, and Edo's having dinner in this beautiful Jew's home. And the old man, to convince Edo to stay over a night so the old man can have more time with the great prophet, the old man tells Edo, the prophet, I was told by God to tell you to sleep over a night. And don't worry what God said because he told me differently. So Edo took the bait. He slept overnight. And indeed... God comes to Edo the next morning and said, I gave you one mission. You did, but you didn't finish it by coming back to Jerusalem. How can you, do, what happened over here? And so God said, uh, you will be killed on your way home to Jerusalem for not listening to my command. And that's what happened. His lion, there was a lion that killed him on the way home. But there was a very interesting miracle that happened with Edo. The lion only killed Edo the prophet, but didn't kill his donkey that he was walking on. So the lion is laying down and he's not doing anything. Not only that, he's sort of protecting the old man that he just killed. And he's also not killing the donkey. So this was a phenomenon for everyone that watched this scene. I'm going to go back to share my screen, which is in your syllabus. I just wanted to show you 
that that picture. Okay, here it is. So here's the picture of the lion that killed the old man. This is Edo. When I say the old man, I mean Edo the prophet. This is the prophet Edo's dead body, and it's being guarded by the lion that just killed Edo. His donkey is standing by. The lion is not killing the donkey. So everyone realizes this is an incredible scene. So right away, Edo tells, the old man who hosted Edo the prophet tells his children, let's go, we have to bury Edo the prophet. So indeed, they bury Edo. The old man himself picks up Edo, this dead Edo the prophet, and buries him. And the old man who always loved doing the mitzvah of hosting people tells his children, when I die, I want you to bury me right next to Edo the prophet. And indeed, that's what happened. Okay, so this is just a little episode that is just giving us a little bit of some of the history line of Yeruvim, the first king who went awry, and of course, Edo as well. I'm going back to my share screen. I just want to go back to the chart of the kings. And... The book of Kings keeps on going back and forth from the kings of Judah to the kings of Israel. The kings of Judah, the kings of Israel. It's actually quite complicated to read directly from the scripture. So we're just going to do a cheat sheet over here. So you have Yeruvim, who we just finished talking about. He had a son, Nadav, who reigned for two years. The older son, his name was Aviyah, actually. Aviyah, who is the same name as this king on the left side. Rechavim's son, Aviyah. A lot of you'll see the names are somewhat similar. A lot of them are family, related, brother-in-laws, step-brother-in-laws, sisters, and things like that. So a lot of the names, so it makes it even more complicated because here you have, as you see, um, you have, for example, okay, there's Rechavim too. But a lot of times you'll see the same names over here. And it's very clear you have to follow the king of Israel or the king of Judah. So Aviyah, Yeruvim's oldest son, Aviyah, was sick. Yeruvim sent his wife to go to Achia Hashiloni, the prophet, and say, please, Achia Hashiloni, please pray for my son, Aviyah, who's at his death, but he's ready to die. God warns Achia Hashiloni that Yeruvim's wife is going to come and ask for a prayer. Yeruvim's wife <coughs> eyes herself so that she shouldn't look like Yeruvim's wife, because as we know, Yeruvim was not a good king. His wife wasn't either a good queen. Guys and herself and said, Achi Ashloni, the prophet, please help me and save my son from dying. And Achi Ashloni, of course, did not do that, did not fulfill that, and said, By the time you come home, your son Aviyah is already dead. So his second son, Nadav, <clears throat> became the king. He only reigned for two years. Then you have Basha, who was another king. Ela is another king. Zimri is another king. Zimri is the first king, Jew, that actually killed Ela. So in other words, there's a Jew killing another Jew to become king. Omri is a general. He was the general of the, this army. And why is he famous, Omri? For two reasons. A, he is the father of the seventh king. His name is Ahav. The rest of the book of Kings, running 20 chapters, discusses the life of Ahav and his wife, Queen Jezebel. So King Ahab is extremely famous in the book of Kings because him and his wife basically um, are basically filled in a lot of the history of the book of Kings. Secondly, why Omri is famous is because he was the one that built um, a palace in the Shomron. So you ever heard of Judah and Samaria? So this is important to listen to. Judah and Samaria, we call it, people call it Gaza and the West Bank today. And um, in Hebrew, it's Judea and Samaria. Why Judea and Samaria? Judea is referring to Jerusalem, and Samaria is from the word Shomron. Where do we get the name Shomron from? From the word Shemer. I'm going to share my screen one last time over here. Give me a second. Because Omri was the person that built this area over here. You see the word Shamir? He bought this plot of land from a guy by the name of Shemer, and he called it Shamron. Here, this, this, this map is calling it Shamir, but it's Shamron. So this is Judah and Shamron, Judea and Samaria. 
it was Omri, that king, the father of Ahab, that bought this plot of land. And what did he do here? He actually made a palace. For the first time, it was only Judah that had a palace. In Jerusalem, there was a palace, King Solomon's palace, the temple. But um, the king of the north, he felt a little bit impoverished. He felt left out because there was no proper palace. So he built this proper palace and a Jewish burial plot for the kings to be buried. So it was in the times of Omri and Ahav where basically this Samaria became finally on the Jewish map. So it's important to remember that piece of data. When we say Judea and Samaria, what's his business? It comes from that era of Omri and Ahav. Okay, I'm stopping the share. Back to me. Okay, there was a lot of issues that the kings of the north had. Uh, they couldn't, they couldn't, on high holidays, what does the, the king do? They come and they read from the Torah. Jews from around the world come, or from Israel would come and pray in the temple on Sukkot. And you can imagine 10 tribes are basically excommunicated from this because they live in the north and they have to have allegiance to their king. So there's tremendous tension even when there's not tension. And on the high holidays, when you have to bring certain sacrifices to the Jerusalem temple and they are being excluded. So this was another reason why Omri built this palace slash temple and an altar, which Ahav basically was like the herald at that time and he made it even more beautiful. And that became a major point of center for the Jewish people in the North in Israel. Okay, any questions before I continue? Okay, good. Now on the other side, wait, wait, there was also, question. go ahead. One question. They, did they build a wall between each other or no? They did, yes, they did. It was Rehavim, the first king, Solomon's son that built that wall to fortify himself because he was always afraid of a civil war, yes. Okay. okay, so on the left side of the king of, of Rehavim we had, so there was already non-Jewish kings that were always trying to like hawks come and invade Jerusalem. Not so much because they wanted to take it over, but you have to remember, we discussed in prior classes, there was so much wealth that King Solomon, you know, uh, amassed in his treasuries. To the extent, if you remember, they had these like 20 foot square blocks of silver on the corners and sidewalks of West Hollywood, the Melrose of Beverly Boulevard. That's how much wealth there was. So there was a king and different multiple kings that were coming and trying to make war and fight. And they weren't never, they were never victorious in invading and taking over Jerusalem but it was almost like sometimes guerrilla warfare and they were able to take different vessels and treasures and, and some chips of silver and things like that. So everyone always blames the Vatican for taking all the vessels from the temple, but you have to remember from the beginning of the first temple to the end of the second temple is roughly 900 years. How many vessels and treasures do you think lasted over hundreds and hundreds of wars and battle until finally when the Rome came and destroyed the second temple in 70 AD. Okay, we, we do know that they took things, but it's not like, you know, there was, you know, like you go to Moscow and you see in the Kremlin, there's, uh, you know, football fields of treasures. I don't think that was the case at the end of the second temple era. Okay, now we have Ahav, King Ahav, who's Omri's son. He's the king of the north. He was a very popular king. He as well was sunken in idol worship. And the first thing he did was he told his general, Chiel, to go and build and rebuild Jericho. Jericho was very close to Jerusalem and to the north, Shamir, and he wanted to rebuild it. Now you remember, Joshua, when he came into the land of Israel, he said, this city has to remain in ruins. So it was a very gutsy move for Ahav to tell his general Chiel to rebuild it. So some people say that when Chiel, the general rebuilt it, he didn't call it Jericho, but he called it Jericho. So it's not like he rebuilt the same Jericho that Joshua forbade. Other people say, no, he, he, did, it, uh, he did it as was. He rebuilt it, which was a prohibition. And indeed, one by one, Chiel's, children's, Chiel's children started to, be, started to die from different pandemics, illnesses, and so forth. It was at this time that Elijah the prophet came to be Menachem Abel to visit Shiva, this guy Chiel. So one day during Shiva, the king, Ahav, who was coming to visit Shiva, Chiel, the general, who's mourning for his children. And at the same day, Elijah the prophet comes. Elijah the prophet was the student of Achiah HaShiloni, Achiah the prophet who, who, who was during the times of King Solomon. 
So Elijah the prophet is here, and he basically is telling Chiel, you know you shouldn't have rebuilt Jericho. So Chiel is already, is, he's so sunken in idol worship and so addicted to his master, King Ahab, even though they're all Jewish over there. And he says, no, this was a natural cause. It wasn't because I rebuilt Jericho. And uh, indeed, Elijah uh, was warning him. King Ahab was mocking him and they're all making fun of Elijah. He's, they sort of like, sort of shoot him out of the house. And Elijah said, as a result of the leaders of the Jewish people of the North, not believing in God, I curse the entire Israel with a famine, a drought for three years. No rain for three years in the land of Israel. And that's what happened. God was very with Elijah the prophet because it was a very aggressive approach to do something like this. In any case, Elijah had to run away. This Elijah actually came from Transjordan. His name was Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu Hatishbi. Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagiladi. What's his business of Hatishbi and Eliyahu Hagiladi? Hatishbi is the name of a city where he came from. So we call him not just Elijah the, the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi, also Eliyahu Hatishbi from the city of Tishba. And why Elio Hagiladi? Because he comes from the tribe of Gad. So it's all the same, Elijah the prophet. In any case, he runs away because there's a, you know, a bounty on his head. And basically feeding Elijah the prophet through black ravens food so that he can live in some cave outside in the outskirts somewhere. Where is Elijah getting this food from? Where are the ravens getting, not the ravens. Yeah, the ravens. Where are the ravens getting this food from? Well, there was a, a, a drought and a famine in the entire Israel, but King Ahab had uh, the royal uh, kitchen and these birds were coming into the kitchen and the basement of this uh, palace and taking little pieces of meat and little pieces of rice. And they were flying, who knows, 20 miles to where Elijah the prophet was hiding and they gave him for food. While, Elijah comes back to town and he tells Ovadia, who was the minister of King Ahab, who was a faithful prophet and a good prophet. This Ovadia was also hiding 100 other prophets and he was also uh, making sure that they had enough food to study and things like that. But Ovadia knows that the king and the queen Jezebel want the death for this Elijah the prophet. So um, he, he says, I'm not giving any message uh, to the king that you're back. He says, no, Elijah, Elijah the, the senior prophet, tells Ovadia, don't worry, you can go tell, tell King Ahab, I'm back and I want to speak to him and his wife, Queen Jezebel. And basically tells him, you know something, let us make a public event. Enough with this hiding of who's the, who's the right prophet, or who's the right God. Let's make a public event. Let's do it at Mount Carmel. And this is the famous story of which we read in the Haftorah, where Elijah says, whoever is for Baal, for the gods of the, um, the male gods and the female gods, come, let's go to this massive desert. We're going to go to, let's say, uh, um, what's the place where they have all the, um, the festivals down in Palm Springs, um, in Yucca, in Yucca Valley, I forget the place over there in Indio. Uh, somewhere by past Palm Springs, they have uh, Coachella. So when I go to a Burning Man, when I go to a big festival, we're going to bring all the thousands of Jews from all over Israel, and we're going to make this public event. And basically, he says we're going to bring a we're going to build a massive altar, and you, Queen Jezebel, and you, King Ahab, you put an animal on your on the altar, and you pray to God, and let's see if a fire comes down from heaven, and if it comes down from heaven, that means there is a God that you worship, that's a real God, the God of the Baal or the God of the Asherah, these male and female gods. And not only that, I'll let you come with all your prophets that believe in these gods. There are roughly 450 prophets. These, 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 like these false prophets, obviously they were spiritual, but they were false prophets. And you can come with all 450 of them and you can come with all of them to this place, this Coachella Valley, let's say that we have this Coachella Burning Man Festival. And they can all pray and for this fire to come down. 
and uh, we'll see what happens. And then I'll do the same. We'll see if a fire comes down on my animal. So that's what happened. Chiel, as general, say the commentators, commentators, he was hiding under the altar with a torch to start the fire. So everyone would think God sent, their God sent down the fire. And when Chiel was ready to light the torch to make this public uh, wonderful declaration that the non-Jewish God is, is the real God, a snake came and ate Chiel or stung him to death and he died. That was the end of Chiel's life. In any case, nothing was happening. No fire came down and um, it was a bit of a dud. Then Elijah comes with his bull and he actually takes two bulls and he makes a lottery. One bull, he is going to, um, actually one bull was actually for the Baal and the other bull was for, for God. So now he, the second one, which, which was dedicated for God, for the, the Jewish God, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Israel. And now he takes the bull and puts it on the altar and he starts to pray for the fire to come down and sacrifice this bull and make a sanctification of God's name publicly. And indeed, that's what happened. But before he did that, Elijah the prophet built trenches around this altar and he filled up like a moat and he filled up these trenches with water. So no one can say there was some spark from summer. It was a, it was a heat wave in the you know, Dead Sea um, in, in the Desert Hot Springs or Death Valley. And uh, indeed, a fire came down and everyone said twice, actually, it says it twice in the Kings. It says, Hashem, who hello came out on I who hello came. All the Jewish people said this twice. Even King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and King Ahab killed all the 450 false prophets, sent their blood down the Kibruk River. And there was a major sanctification of God's name through this amazing event through Mount Carmel. At, at, at Mount Carmel. This is where it happened, this event. And of course, the Talmud has to discuss what gave Elijah the prophet the right to make an altar and to bring a sacrifice outside the Jerusalem temple. And they have to answer that he didn't make an edict, a new edict or a new decree that were allowed to build sacrifices or bring sacrifices outside Jerusalem. But this is what we call a Shas Hashra, a one-time temporary lift for him to make a sanctification of God's name. Now, we're not over just yet because there's still this, this uh, famine. So God tells Elijah, I want you to go to this widow's house and uh, you'll hang out there. So he goes to this widow and basically he asks this widow for some drink and some food. And the widow says, I'm a poor widow, I have a baby boy. My husband died and I really have nothing. So Elijah says, you have nothing? So she says, I have a few kernels of flour I have a little bit of wheat and I have a few drops of oil. So Elijah tells her, take the wheat and take the oil. They'll make a mixture, make some cakes. And this mixture, this batter will never cease. It will never stop. You can make unlimited cake and unlimited loaves of bread with this wheat and with this oil. And that's how she sustained herself and him. And again, the commentaries tell us, look how Elijah was so aggressive on the Jewish people. And he caused this drought for so many years. Yet this widow who had no food and no sustenance was prepared to give up from her little bit of her pocketbook and help a person that she didn't even know. In any event, after around a year, give or take, this boy dies. The widow's boy dies. And the woman is crying to Elijah the prophet and says, you know, before you came, life was okay for me. But now you came and um, people that TMZ of that time was, was accusing her of perhaps sleeping around with this guy, Elijah, that no one really knew. And perhaps that's why the son died, the baby died. So Elijah pleads from God to make resurrection of the dead that I should be able to revive this child. And God tells Elijah the prophet, there are three things that I did not gift that people have control over and those three things that I did not gift to the human species the control over is rain is birth and death these three things are not in anyone's hand when a person is going to be born when a person is going to die and excuse me when a person is going to be born resurrection and rain. Those three things are out of humans. So God tells Elijah, 
you already took control over rain from me. Where you ordered this drought and I have no control over because you, you took my secret of when it could and can't rain and you have good. Now you're also asking me for the second of the third secret, which is the resurrection. So God tells Elijah, I will give you the gift to be able to do the resurrection and to allow this child to live once again. But you have to give rain back to me. And you have to allow rain to once again fall on the land of Israel, which is what happened. So Elijah equipped to God and he allowed for rain to come back. And he indeed did the resurrection and his child continued to live. Or I should say the child really was resurrected. And once again, the Talmud tells us that this child would become later Jonah the prophet. And we just have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try to push it forward. And indeed, this is when that story of Mount Carmel happened. And at the end of this, he tells, Elijah now tells his student, Elisha, who's later going to become the great Elisha the prophet. And he tells Elisha, I'm going to bring rain back. And I want you now to look up into this beautiful blue sky. And Elijah crouches down on, 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 a, on like a meditative uh, yoga position with his uh, back towards Elisha. And he tells Elisha, I'm going to now start to pray. And you start to tell me if you see any clouds coming. And Elisha says, I'm sorry, Master, but I see no clouds coming. And Elijah continues to pray in this meditative yoga stand. And says, do you see any clouds coming? And again, Elisha says, there are no clouds. He does this seven times until finally Elisha says, I can see with a fingertip in the sky, I see indeed a little cloud. And that cloud becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And indeed, rain starts to fall and rain falls hard. It falls so hard that the people of Israel forgot that there was once a drought and that there was once a famine and life came back to normal. Now it ends with one more very, a few more interesting stories. We're not going to cover it all. But basically, King Ahab decided that he wants this beautiful vineyard that was in the north, near his hometown, by the Shamron, by Samaria. And it was owned by a gentleman by the name of Navos, N-A-V-O-S. Navos was his name. And Ahab really wanted this uh, beautiful vineyard. And he thought he'll make his summer house in this beautiful uh, courtyard over there. And... Um, Navos didn't want to give it to him. Navos said, uh, King Ahab, you know, <laughs> whatever, I don't talk too much or high of you, but that's not here, not there. But either way, I'm not giving it to you. And uh, Navos held strong. Ahab comes home back that night to the palace, and his wife, Queen Jezebel, is, uh, asks her husband, what's the story here? Now, Queen Jezebel, she was a convert who ends up marrying the king, King Ahab. She converted, right? But like Batya, King Solomon's wife, it was questionable what kind of conversion it was. In Queen Jezebel's case, there was no question because she's the one really that brought all the, all the idol worship and all these gods with her to the culture of the Jewish people to the extent of, like I said, the 450 prophets and the, the male gods and the female gods. She brought all that shtus and all that shmutz to the Jewish people. And again, because the Jewish people at the time were so addicted to idol worship, it was just, uh, just icing on the cake for them. So this Queen Jezebel was never really a good friend of the Jewish people. At least her husband, King Ahab, recognized that there was a God of Israel. It's just that he got uh, stuck in some other idol worship, the male gods, the female gods, and so forth. But he always remembered about his Zaydas and his Bubbies. He always remembered that once upon a time, King Solomon reigned all of 12 tribes. King Ahab didn't forget the Torah. He studied the Torah. He understood the power of Elijah the prophet and so forth. The Queen Jezebel was a, was a no good. So this Queen Jezebel told and decided that she is going to help her husband, King Ahab, possess and acquire Navos's vineyards so that her husband can build his beautiful summer house. So she goes and she brings the Bet Din of this town where Navos lived. I'm trying to see where this town was. I don't see this name of the city. Uh, no, oh, Yisrael. Okay, that's the name I have, I have it here. And uh, she convinced basically the townsmen, the, the bet din of that town, that Navos was committing acts of treason and slander to the king of Israel, to her husband, King Ahav. 
and acts of treason and slander and gossip like this is no good. And it's, you get the death penalty to curse, to use, uh, you know, to curse in God's name in vain. And uh, she basically convinced the Betin to stone this guy Navos to death. And as a result, her husband, King Ahab, was able to possess Navos' vineyard. This is a very interesting uh, situation over here because at the very end of Ahab's life, when finally a prophet, Michayahu, told Ahab at the very end of his life that he's going to fight a certain battle against another king by the name of Ben Hadad. And this Michayahu told King Ahab in front of everybody that you're going to fight this battle, you're going to win the battle, and all the people are going to come home safe and sound, but their leader, their master, will not. He will die in battle, which was a prophecy that Ahab is going to die. And Ahab didn't really believe him. This point in time, Ahab formed an alliance with the king of Judah, whose name was Jehoshaphat, which you can look later is on the left side of your chart. So Ahab and Jehoshaphat are actually stepbrother-in-laws, and they formed an alliance. And Jehoshaphat said to Ahab, listen, we got to listen to Mikhail, who's the prophet of the time. And uh, Ahab said, no, I'm not listening to him. I'm listening to my prophets. And all of his prophets, I think it was like 230 prophets, told uh, King Ahab, don't worry, you'll be just fine. But Mikhail come, Mikhail told Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and Ahab, the king of Israel, you're not going to survive this battle. And Mikhail continued, and he said, I saw in a dream that the ministering angels were discussing which sin is going to be the cause for Ahab to die. Some commentators say, not which sin, but which deed should defend Ahab from going to the pearly gates after he dies. Because we skipped a part where Ahab did a lot of teshuva, a lot of repentance after the whole business with Mount Carmel, and then the rain came down. So he had a lot of uh, thanks to Elijah the prophet. He did a lot of teshuva. But now it's at the very end of his life, and uh, he wants to do the right thing. He doesn't want to listen to Mechayel. And but Mechayel is telling him in this dream, Mechayel is telling, in his, he's telling him that my prophecy is that I had a dream. And these ministering angels are haggling over, which is very interesting because this almost sounds like a piece of uh, Kabbalah. But it's actually in chapter 22, verse 19, where Mechayo is discussing in his prophecy what he saw of these ministering angels discussing back and forth what's the story over here as to, will Ahab die? And which sin is it that he's going to die from? Or which mitzvah should defend him? And it wasn't clear amongst the ministering angels, continues Mechayel in his prophecy. Finally, a spirit comes, and the Talmud of Tractate Sanhedrin, page 103, tells us that it was the spirit of Navos. This Navos that was killed and was stoned to death because he was accused of slander and treason to the king. This spirit of Navos comes and says, it's because of my sin, it's because of the sin that got me killed, and that I'm up here now because of Ahav, that's why Ahav should die in this next battle. So, in the prophecy, God tells the spirit, leave from here, and do what you got to do. And the Talmud in Sanhedrin explains to us that God doesn't want to be involved in trickery. Because basically, this spirit of Navos forced those 250 false prophets to tell Ahab and Yehoshaphat that Ahab is going to win this fight and Ahab will be successful and don't worry about it. So that's why God told the spirit, get away from me, do what you got to do. Because God didn't want to execute a judgment with trickery and guile. That he should sneak this false prophecy amongst these 250 false prophets that Ahab should go into battle. So Navos did that, so he left. So he left and told those 250 prophets, go and uh, tell Ahab that he'll be victorious. And indeed, Ahab listened to those 250 prophets as a result of the spirit of Navos. And they didn't listen to Mikhail, who's the real prophet, 
that he shouldn't go. It's a bit tricky what I'm saying over here. I hope you get it. But the Sanhedrin tractic, the Talmud uh, explains these few verses of verse 19, which to me was very fascinating that uh, the books of prophet, the books of these, uh, of these, of these history books is going to give us such an esoteric uh, prophecy. And uh, in any case, it was Mida connected. Mida was measure for measure because Achov gave false testimony on Navos that he was uh, committing these acts of treason and doing gossip on the king. So measure for measure, Navos' spirit forced this false testimony that's come about from these 250 false prophets. And that's basically how Kings 1 ends with the death of Ahav, and indeed he was killed in that battle. And Elijah the prophet then transfers his power of prophecy onto his student, Elisha, who continues to be an, a committed student to Elijah. And Kings 2, which we're going to discuss in the next class, will begin with the death of Elijah and the transferring of power to Elisha and exactly this episode as to what exactly happened, um, which we'll discuss in next class. And that finishes again, roughly the first seven kings of the side of Judah, the first seven kings on the side of Israel. Again, most of the book of Kings discusses this history, this chunk of history during the times of King Ahab, Queen Jezebel and Elijah the prophet. And Kings 2, which is next class, will continue with Elijah and will continue with Elisha, his student, and then will continue with the end of um, the entire book of Kings 2, which we'll do in next class, which will discuss ultimately the destruction of the first temple. And that finishes our class. So I'm stopping over here. I'm stopping the recording.